on the spot, I tend to like receive a thing mm -hmm. um, and I can kind of hyper fix it. So it's like I can kind of center on my understanding in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then later on, it can come back around and I'm like, oh, yeah, now nah, that threw me. So Every day has its sermon. Mm -hmm. And so what I tend to find is like, if I get on the, we'll say like the ripple early enough, I recognize the wave by the time it comes and mm -hmm. I already know what's up. So- Have you ever surfed before? No. Okay. I just use it as an analogy. Okay. Um, so to that point, mm -hmm. when it comes to a lot of the content, it's like life will do its own thing where um, the, the, you know, topic that I'm bringing up on class or the thing that's going on for the day, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, things kind of just bring themselves together. Mm -hmm. So I'm very used to that experience of yeah. like, yeah, that would track or that would make sense that we've been talking about X and now it's time for this and then next week it'll be time for this. Mm -hmm. And then astrologically, all of that lines up for this and this season and this retrograde and that, like. And you guys didn't see that coming? Yeah, like for me it's infinite <laughs> patterns, literally infinite patterns. And it's less, I don't even know that it's so much like, mm -hmm. did you see that coming? I think it's more, because I like one of the things that I notice is like the, the spiritual space, mm -hmm creates a lot of assumption that we always know exactly what we're talking about. And in the DMs between me and like colleagues, other creators, mm -hmm. um, like I have like a disproportionate following of like peers mm -hmm. in terms of like their followings and then like our <laughs> level of interaction. It's like, it'd be really funny to me. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the conversations are usually about how like we just kind of said some shit yeah and then later on like a month later it, like really you know hones in on something where you're like oh shit that's what i was talking about but like you don't really know in the moment what you're talking about you're kind of just flowing yeah like literally when you think about channeling it's like your television is not taking into consideration the programming it's showing you mm -hmm. it's just displaying a thing yeah and Channeling is literally just being a television set for somebody. And its responsibility is just knowing, hey, I'm on the right channel. Yeah. That's about it. That's it. Yeah. All right, you can start um, scrubbing whenever you are ready. I'm like, I'll take the opportunity just on the basis of these need a clean mm -hmm. anyway. Clean me, Master. Please. Clean me. Is that positioning where you are your comfortable position? Like your power position of cleaning a sneaker? Like yeah. do you feel comfortable there? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll line the lens up over there then. Because you know how sometimes folks are testing things out? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask like, hey, are you testing? Is that like your usual position? Do you just stick to it? Because from what I've noticed in the interview, sometimes you'll have folks who they'll lift the sneaker up to them and they'll do it like this, like right up here. And uh, I'm like, hey man, yeah. we shoot from the collarbone down. If you have it up there, now you technically put yourself in position where your face has to be exposed in the shot. Right. So like, are you okay with people seeing your lips and your nose? And most people's like, oh no, you know, no, that's fine. But mm -hmm. then they'll see it on film and they're like, oh man, I didn't think yeah. that my face and my nose was gonna be in the shot. And it's like- We went over this. Fam, I, I literally said your face in your nose is in the shot. <laughs> there was a whole conversation about said face and said nose. There's there's something to be said for the uh, the delta between communication and comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's underserved. Where it's like people get a lot of points for communication. Mm -hmm. uh, but like communication is only worth is uh, it's only worth 
as much as the comprehension on the other side. Do you have a good digestive system, yes or no? Do I? Because communicating, if you think of communicating oh, okay. I, think, as, I didn't know if you were asking me that question. Or if no, 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 no. Just analogy. That's an interesting question. Because communicating is you're chewing the food, right? right? You have all the flavor, all the palates and everything else. Yeah. But digestion mm, is I think there's notes of, mm, there's how many cool. nutrients am I getting? What is right. the thing that I'm eating supposed to help? Is it actually accomplishing it? And if the answer is no, what do I need to change in my diet for me to better feed myself and be healthier? Because mm -hmm. remember, when you measure how your relationships are with people, it usually comes up of like, hey, do you have good communication? And if the answer is yes, do you actually understand what that person has communicated to you within that time that right. you agreed to? So let me tell you, my communication is top notch. Comprehension, mm -hmm. not always it. Well, it's, it's a factor of who I'm talking to, mm -hmm. which again, like infinite loop, right? So it's like, that could be that person's communication. Yeah. But overall, I would say like, on the spot, I tend to like, receive a thing mm -hmm. um, and I can kind of hyper fix it. So it's like I can kind of center on my understanding in the moment mm -hmm. and then later on it can come back around and I'm like, oh yeah, now that threw me because I was so stuck on this thing that you said. Mm -hmm. So I try to be more, I guess, transient in my understanding and like allow my reference point to revolve. Yeah. What's your inner voice like with yourself? Hmm. Inner voice is like It's just me against myself And mm -hmm. it's not like me against myself As like a separate entity Like it's literally me just going back and forth With questions yeah. and answers um, So like I would say like right off top I don't really resonate with that idea Of like an inner voice that's in opposition to you Like I very much feel And maybe that's just an egoistic alignment mm -hmm. But like I feel like me and that guy are the same guy most of the time. Um, or like we reach an understanding mm -hmm. where it feels very much like we're the same person. Um, I think there are... Yeah, I think it just comes down to like how you identify with the voice. Like, yeah. because I so frequently hear mine in terms of like self-talk, whether it's positive or negative, mm -hmm. um, what occurs is like maybe correction, like a, a, a judgmental thought pops up and it's like, all right, you don't need to do all that. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I don't really, I think other voices that occur in my head are like almost everybody else's. Um, which I think is like a function of PTSD mm -hmm. and what I would call my gift as far as channel. Um, I don't remember if we talked about this in the first interview, but there's a thing around, I have clients with like, um, or I work with people who, who have like mental health issues right and to like mm -hmm. generalize because there's such a, a spectrum of mental health but to generalize if someone was to talk to me in a session about like voices that they heard mm -hmm. my focus is going to be on what did they say and what did you say back more so than whether or not it was a real voice that's not my job like yeah i trust you to perceive what you perceived so we're going to go with that assumption being truth what do we do with that information because mm -hmm. your response is more important than the perception part of it to me yeah um and because i'm not fucking licensed or qualified to talk about it in in those capacities anyway yeah um so to that point i feel like i hear people's voices in my head all the time mm -hmm. um and it's again, after their dialogue after they describe what's going on um, let's say, for example, like I walk into the crib and you say something, mm -hmm. there's like sub, not subtext, but it's almost like a, 
if I were to describe it as an auditory experience, it'd be like a, a quiet recording played underneath what you said mm. that might hide or have other layers to it. Mm -hmm. There's getting too caught up in that and like whether or not it's true. Because if I get caught up in it's like that was really Juice's voice. One, I hold you accountable to things you didn't say, but that you thought whether it was true or not. Yeah. It's like that's a that's that's a violation. Like you didn't actually say that shit. Yeah. I check myself for shit that I think all the time. Yeah. Um, and he can't and then, be responsible for those words. Yeah, not yeah. at all. Yeah. Um, and so the other side of it becomes, okay, well, if I believe that's a projection, let's say there's like, I believe that there's a judgment. It's like, I can just kind of adjust to the judgment because chances are I'm judging myself so I can just respond. Mm -hmm. um, I've said to clients, the difference between discernment and judgment is saying it out loud. Mm. Yeah. So if you just keep that shit to yourself mm -hmm. and move accordingly, yeah. you never have to worry about judgment. Yeah. It's like, oh, this person did something to me. I don't think they have my best interests at heart. I'm gonna remove myself. Mm -hmm. That person would be like, oh, you judged me just off that one little thing that I couldn't protect you from every little thing? And it's like, no, I just had discernment. Like I had an internal thing that said, hey, mm -hmm. I may not get the experience I'm looking for and I removed myself. Yeah. But you can't call that judgment. And it's, uh, it's like that separation in the, in the religious realm. I was dealing with it as like the separation between sin and intent. Mm -hmm. It's not a sin to kill, it's a sin to murder. Yeah. So now we're talking about context and perspective. You no, you no, no, I get what you're saying. What you're saying for that example is you committing a sin doesn't mean you had the intentions to commit a sin. So, like, let's say someone dies because you defended yourself and they were attacking you, right? And they happen to fall onto a pitchfork. Yeah, you didn't know the pitchfork was there, you were simply defending yourself mm -hmm. but you've now committed a quote-unquote sin in the person dying but it's like I right, but was my intention to do that to them defending right. myself was the intention now the outcome of that person no longer being of this earth wasn't the intention right and it's yeah. like from a from the judgment of like let's just use religion as the subtext here mm -hmm. from the judgment side yeah whether or not you're held accountable to murder is based on why you killed the person, why the person lost their life, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, there's plenty of stories in the Bible of people killing people. Yeah. Then there's stories in the Bible of people murdering people and the Bible distinguishes a difference between the intent and like circumstance. Mm -hmm. So um, when I hear a voice or when I hear a channel, let's just keep it to channel. When I hear a channel, it's my responsibility to discern whether or not that channel is worth relaying to somebody else, mm -hmm. acting on uh, whatever. And over time, the idea is you get uh, better and better discernment. But at the end of the day, it's like, if I resonate with the judgment that I thought you had, mm -hmm. I should just respond to it and worry less about whether or not you had it. Yeah. That also sounds like a lot of self-management on your part. Mm -hmm. Like, um, mm -hmm. what's the largest book you've ever read? Ooh. The largest book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. Um, probably Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is like the first one that pops up in my head is just like the physical size of it. Because mm -hmm. um, that, that book is like bigger than most textbooks. Yeah. Like the hardcover version. Yeah. Um, but like at the same time, like I'm a I'm a prolific like I read a lot so it's it's hard for me to narrow it down based on um, like size because I think there's like there's scope right like mm -hmm. if you ask somebody like the the longest like series they've ever ran through mm -hmm. right yeah. and like one person says uh, Lord of the Rings and the other person says Animorphs it's mm -hmm. like the person who says Animorphs has technically read more pages mm -hmm. but Lord of the Rings is like an epic that Animorphs does not even come close to touching it's like yeah. that's like a graphic novel in, in word form mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so mm -hmm. it's like 
context is everything. But I'd say probably like front to back, most likely it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. You're the second person I've heard reference Animorphs in a sit down in like a month. It's a 90s thing for <laughs> sure. Like that's generational. That's generational. Cause that was like, mm -hmm. this is like, Animorphs is like before Twilight, before Harry Potter. It's before any of these other like, um, other forms of expressive dialogue. Well, what happened is when uh, Harry Potter showed up, mm -hmm. there became this trend of like young adult series, mm -hmm. Percy Jackson, yeah. like the, and they would have like three to four mm -hmm. books, books, but it'd be like a tight yeah. story, or it was meant to yeah. be like a tightly woven story. And that's when people stuck to the, you have to tell a story in threes for it to be a good story. Yeah, so yeah. it's like you see how capitalism starts warping like the, the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, but Ooh, what an before that, Huh? What an observation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's wild. Like, you're like, yo, like, there's, I mean, even when you think about uh, movies, there used to be movies mm -hmm. about, like, a conversation between two people at a dinner table. Yeah. Now you need a universe in order to justify mm -hmm. the conversation with two people at the dinner table. It's like, no, 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 that has to link to a thing which creates a thing which does a thing. Mm -hmm. So it's just the way that, like, successful IP violates people's creative process, essentially. Yeah. But um, before that point, it was series, like mm -hmm. these like never ending series. Mm -hmm. So you would have like Anne Rice like continuing to write books on books on books of these yeah. vampire uh, characters. You have the Animorph series, um, stuff like that. So I think, um, yeah, I come from I come from that school of thought. Like I come from that uh, that history where it was like you would really dig in all over that long a period of time. Mm -hmm. But um, when, once I got a hold of stuff like Lord of the Rings, I started looking for density more yeah. so than like length. So the reason I asked that question is when it comes to how you perceive the work versus your self-maintenance, I think the more we do this work when it comes to mental health, wellness, and spirituality, there's a certain amount of chapters that we start adding to the book of, hey, not am I heading in the right direction, but am I taking care of this equipment mm -hmm. in terms of myself and how much am I unloading from what I've learned or experienced? Because you don't need to take every experience you've had into the newer rooms that you get into or mm -hmm. the older rooms that you've built so far. Yeah, and I think that's like the, the release part. And, um honestly ties perfectly into my uh, PTSD comment. Figuring out when that experience has served its purpose and is no longer of use, mm -hmm. like, bro, you can let that go. You don't need to respond to that the same way anymore. Yeah. Um, I think like when we look at a veteran who like ducks because a, a engine made a loud noise on the street, mm -hmm. it's very easy for people to go like, oh yeah, PTSD, I can understand how that could be like stressful. Yeah. But there are so many other things that occur for the individual and honestly it's like based on a personal scope or uh, spectrum mm -hmm. where like trauma to one person could be as simple as just someone raising their voice around them and them having a, a gut reaction to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like as you appreciate the like broader scope of experiences it's yeah. like yo you, like many people are not operating on their proper like uh i guess like system you know what i mean they're operating on like fight or flight and mm -hmm. just response yeah what would you say you operate on Ooh. <laughs> these sides these sides that I'm able to accomplish in these conversations um I oscillate between the, the two I think mm -hmm. I think there's like a there's a level of it that I travel through where I'm present and you know meditative I kind of like I know where I'm coming from so I know where I'm going kind of energy mm -hmm. um but there are definitely other times where I'm just going off of response, um, going off of like trauma. Like I'm, I'm speaking for myself when I talk about the idea of like keeping experiences with you mm -hmm. that don't serve you anymore. Yeah. Um, but I also 
am kind of like I'm I'm wading through so much change that I don't have an assumption about my operating mode anymore. Mm -hmm. At least not right now. Yeah. Um, I'm so cognizant of like how in process it is that it's like it'd be hard for me to define and sit on something because it would only resonate until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know? Do you consider meditation a process or a moment in time? I don't know that I see a difference between those two points. Okay. Um, your meditation practice is made up of like moments in time and like how you choose to meet that moment. Mm -hmm. And meditation is just allowing yourself to like marinate in moments um, and like allow them to pass. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you do one and it feeds the other. Um, they're, they're intrinsically connected. Um, I think in moments of response, or at times, at times when uh, life calls you to respond, mm -hmm. it's a moment. Yeah. Um, the progression of your response is the process. The reason I ask this question, have you cleaned both sneakers? Yeah. Uh, can you do the bottom of each sneaker yeah, now? Sure. I'd say use the big brush for it. The reason I uh, bring this up is I think it's, Meditation to me is a vicarious process, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know how folks say, hey, I live vicariously through you and what you're doing. When it comes to meditating, I use meditation to move closer to who I would like to be for the day or that part of the day once I've started my process. Mm -hmm. So meditation to me isn't simply thinking about what you're going through emotionally to me meditation starts with okay this feeling you may be feeling that you're currently working your way through in this process do you remember what in the day or in your life triggered this feeling and why you may be having this depth of feeling at this moment and then i work my way back from there mm -hmm. And I tell folks, hey, this isn't for everyone because like there are ways to make whatever meditation experience you're having very intense versus, hey, I just want this to simply be a snicker bar. <laughs> for, sure. for sure. Right. Like last night, for exact, for example, sometimes I'll get into a process where my brain's on autopilot and then I'll realize, oh, my mind is having a conversation with my thoughts and I just happen to be in the room hearing the conversation and mm -hmm. I need them to get quiet, which means, okay, I now need to make a decision saying, hey, we have an interview in seven hours. Mm -hmm. You guys have been talking for 45 minutes. And the more you talk, the less sleep we get, which means the rest, the less rest we'll get. Mm -hmm. So whatever conversation you're trying to have, either you guys get to the point or I'm going to shut this whole thing down and it's just going to be me in darkness for the rest of the night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that was literally last night before this interview. Like I was rolling around, rolling around, rolling around. I said, what's happening? I was like, look, you're. You're thinking about things that are going to come in the future, which literally is a month and a half to two months from now. Mm -hmm. And your mind's deciding, hey, let's have this conversation now, because normally you would be up doing work. And since you're not up doing work and you're trying to get rest, your mind thinks, well, we're supposed to be used at this time. So the habit of being used means, well, we should be functionally thinking about things. And it's like, now nah, I've given you permission to no longer think about things. But my brain is like, but we want to. And it's like, well, it's not about you today. Right. Yeah. 
No, I definitely uh, resonate with that. It's it, Honestly, it makes me think about the last conversation. It's funny, I was looking at clips before mm -hmm. I came here. Yeah. But the last conversation that we had uh, where, what was it that I had said? Um, you were, we were talking about, I said, uh, your landlord will take the thousand dollars tomorrow. And you say, but he won't three months from now. And I said, you don't exist three months from now. So what are we talking about? And that's like essentially what I was trying to get at. It's mm -hmm. like, which yeah. is the reference to Atlanta too. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you don't exist three months from now. Yeah. So if you can do things to secure that, do that. Mm -hmm. But what you're dealing with in most cases is like, if we're being honest, probably a failure to do what you should have done three months ago. Yeah. So just take that into account and do the thing you should do three months from now today. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of work your way backward or forward from there. Yeah. But, um, you know, plot your... Earlier I used an analogy of ripples and waves. Mm -hmm. If you're the one throwing the stone, you're choosing the origination point of the wave. Yeah. So you just have to give yourself enough room for it to become a substantial wave. Yeah. Or you have to learn to surf the wave. And drop it big enough. If you're not one with the wave. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is like in this analogy, mm -hmm. you drop the stone, it becomes the wave, you surf the wave. Yeah. So you can't create a wave, mm -hmm. but you can drop a stone. Yeah. And so it's like, what stone are you finna drop? Mm -hmm. Make the wave. And I think the other part of that is if you don't drop the stone, somebody else will. Ooh. Say that. Because there's always going to be a force with trees. Yeah. You don't drop the stone, life will drop that bitch for you. Yeah. When it comes to the process of serving the community, mm -hmm. do you ever come in with concerns or do you show up making observations of what's going on and figuring out where do I belong in this system that's in front of me? When you say not all concerns. cities are the same. What right. do you mean by show up with concerns? So the work that we do, mm -hmm. we focus on internal dialogue. That's the work that we do. Yeah. Hey, that conversation that you had when you were cleaning your tools or that conversation that you had right after you were finished arguing with your girl, let's, let's discuss this here as men mm -hmm. with the spaces that we plan on creating, right? Mm -hmm. And technically speaking, our concerns are, hey, are we allowing our brethren to have the correct conversations or take those conversations in the right directions, right? Because we don't want you to lose what's precious to you, but it's also very easy to take what you've been taught as a child or what you've observed as your parents and say, that's how you handle things. And it's like, actually, no. So let's compare right. each other's notes. I think uh, when you're dealing with community, similar to any relationship, mm -hmm. um, like I think about it as like the, the media stepfather. Mm -hmm. So the media stepfather has to contend with the you're not my dad energy. You're not my dad. But, as, but also like kind of convey a level of like trust, a level of intimacy, a level of care, concern, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So in order to facilitate that, um, you know, when you're, if you're going to assist a wounded animal, it's best to approach hands up, palms out, and usually offering food. When you're talking about community and coming from the perspective of, okay, I have done this work, so I'm aware of the wound. The last thing you want to do is run out screaming and pointing at the wound, right? Um, so I think the, the first part of serving community is making community feel safe. You have to build community spaces first before you get at what you believe the problem is because one, I've, I've found that in doing the work of like allowing people to, I guess, select their own syllabus, we usually end up addressing things that were roots that I didn't even realize were roots. So by the time we get to what I'm focused on, it's really easy work. But if I'm so honed in on this being the danger zone because of my trauma with myself or my judgment with myself, not only do I rob the person of the progression to get to the point of awareness that I got to, but 
I could end up further tangling up something that they need to untie over here on this side. So the, I feel like the work that we do is very much a balance of like being careful of how much of your experience bleeds into the conversation, um, but just creating and deepening professional intimacy in a way that allows people to feel safe without violating like the boundaries of the relationship. Nice. So definitely observation. Hell yeah. Yeah, because you're not just stepping in with answers. I don't, I honestly don't think most people say, hey, I just want answers. They're either afraid of the process or their imagination has created this very long winded thing. Mm -hmm. But technically, the process is what the real answer is. Most people think yeah. the answer for the problem is like, well, I have the answer. Now I know what I need to do. And it's like, yeah, but the way you go into executing things matters because that's what people pay attention to. Like when yeah. you grow after the mistakes of who you may have been or when you self-correct when it comes to the way that you're living or not living, that's what people observe. Hey, you've changed. Mm -hmm. They usually give you a new chance because you've changed right. or because you're at least building up the habit towards what they would need to be able to comfortably exist and trust you mm -hmm. and who you are. And I always find that fascinating. People tell you a lot about yourself if you are willing to listen. Yeah. Uh, and not the things that they say, but the way that they act. Mm -hmm. Like when you trust someone you pull them in so it's like look at the people who pull you in they trust you yeah. like <laughs> yeah. um, allowing that to be a simple truth allows you to spend or devote your creativity to more beneficial things mm -hmm. like figuring out ways to make them feel appreciated for that yeah but like if someone's already said thank you the last thing you need to do is figure out ways to provoke gratitude out of them. It's like they just said thank you. You can move on to something else now. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, honestly, it's a big part of what I find happens within um, people's talks in the intimacy space. What's wrong with men? What's wrong with women? It's a lot of, like, lack of gratitude from either side. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't think the, either, the other side is the side you want to get the gratitude from. I think there's a you thing present. Yeah. Because if you appreciated that about yourself, you wouldn't need someone else to point it out. And it's mm -hmm. sometimes I think, or rather before you get to the point of emotional awareness where that makes sense, mm -hmm. that can sound like a cliche answer. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you put a dope t-shirt on, you, can, you felt good before you walked outside. Mm -hmm. Before a single person gave you a compliment, you were yeah. like, I got that shit on. Yeah. It's the same thing with any other trait you could possibly think of. It's only once someone takes it away from you that you realize that like, oh shit, I gave someone else power. Mm -hmm. But up to that point, you're walking around strong. Yeah. Um, I think when people get caught up in like what the other side isn't doing, it's like you're telling on yourself, right? Yeah. So it's like, they're, oh, these guys aren't like intentional with their time. It's mm -hmm. like, they're not. So you can create intention for the time and teach them how to do it. Mm -hmm. Or you can deal with the fact that they don't. But like, you're giving me the observation. <laughs> yeah. React to the observation. Yeah. And for the other side of it, it's like, yo, they're asking for so much or whatever. It's like, so give more. Because mm -hmm. they're asking for more. Yeah. So like, that, that is your answer. If you don't have more, you should probably save it so you can give it to somebody you really want to give it to. Yeah. But it's not rocket science. There's not like a secret answer where you go, oh, if you do this this way, you can progressively juggle. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Put it all down <laughs> until you're ready to pick it that's up. That's right, That's exactly what you thought it was before. Exactly. I think uh, the gratitude conversation is particularly important because to me, the important part of the gratitude conversation is you're also allowed to leave in gratitude. Oh, yeah. If whoever you're looking to get that fix from, right, or you don't feel appreciated, the other half of the conversation is, well, why are you staying there mm -hmm. if you don't feel appreciated and you know the person is not willing to find that? And even... I think finding that is going too far. Sometimes it's simply about, is that person 
looking for a way to give you that gratitude because not everyone's going to find it but the mm. question always is hey man are they at least working on maybe i can get a couple of scraps of gratitude for you next week mm. and i'm building up towards that mm. because the gratitude conversation the other half of that is you in some way shape and form are surrounding yourself with those people mm -hmm. which means you've given them permission to be around and then it comes up well i like them so why wouldn't i like them around me and it's like yeah you like them but it sounds like you like them at the price of yourself right and until you start acknowledging that price or acknowledging what that price does to you are you really getting the gratitude that you've been begging for and seeking or are you simply accepting whatever is in stock and that's that's kind of what i mean by like mm -hmm. they're telling you about yourself right yeah if there is something about a person that you are willing to deny a part of yourself in order to be around an experience mm -hmm. it is because that is part of you that experience is part of you it's a thing that you do that you just stop doing yeah but like there's no other reason for you to barter with self mm -hmm. Because anything from outside that was like that valuable, yeah, would that would be that valuable because it received you on arrival, not because you did something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know the the gift that somebody, the gift of a car that someone buys you is always going to mean more. Like when it's really a no strings attached gift, because mm -hmm. there's life. Yeah. But when it's actually a no strings attached thing, it's like that's infinitely more valuable than if you would have bought the thing yourself. Oftentimes what we're putting on our list of wants is a bunch of things we could have gotten ourselves, mm -hmm. and other people go get them and we feel great about them going to do that yeah um so i think that like in most cases if you can think of a trait or some sort of aspect of an experience that you're willing to drop a part of yourself in order to retain mm -hmm. it's probably something that you're capable of doing yeah and there's like just some gas that you get from getting it from somewhere else but like you got it yeah and once you get used to doing it yourself you'll be asking yourself why you ever let anyone else do it you're like i'm actually better at this <laughs> and you can go receive something new um but up to that point you'll be like kicking yourself like yo i feel why'd i let that go yeah like, that i used right to have there. this on autopilot and yeah. on tap and it's like yeah. you still do yeah you just have to press buttons yeah and also rework the muscle you know so what are the name of these shoes? These are uh, Union Ones. Uh, they are a uh, Air Jordan, Air Jordan One. Mm -hmm. um, they are a collaboration with uh, Union LA, which mm -hmm. is a um, sneaker. Uh, what do you call it? Like customization. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, You're the second person to bring sure. a pair of unions into this house. I love unions. Man. Yeah, my guy uh, Bo, he also yeah. fucks with some unions. If you, you look can up, see, I like him and beat yeah. the shit. But <laughs> I uh, I got the the blue the this colorway, and then there's like a black and red colorway that mm -hmm. I got. The thing is, I'm not actually a big Jordan person. Really? Yeah, I mm -hmm. have like my greatest hits type thing is like these two being one of them, uh, and then. There's probably a couple of other pairs of ones. I was actually like, what it is is when I was uh, when I was in high school, I was a big SB Dunks person. So in it's Boston. like, yeah, this is in uh, Boston. Yeah. Um, so it's like SB Dunks, the yeah. the AJ one is like right there, mm -hmm. and so um, that's really why I like them. Like it's because I just came up on SBs like the high top SBs mm -hmm. and uh, the SB Dunks are very similarly designed, but these. Um, I like creative, I guess, like parts of offerings, like classic offerings that you can't necessarily or won't see everywhere. Yeah. So as many different pairs of ones as there are, the patchwork between the top and the bottom, to me, is like the coolest part. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also this dude on Instagram, uh, Chef Hoi Lee. Um, he's a, uh, like another sneaker refabricator. And he does like a bunch of different colorways of stuff like this so yeah. just take the top and sew it to the bottom mm. what makes this shoe your everyday shoe um so going back to the sb dunk thing mm -hmm. 
we danced in these growing up. Like yep. this is a big part of crump culture for me. Mm -hmm. um, is having like those, the kicks that like you love, like they look dope and they make a fit look fire, mm -hmm. but also like they're beat enough that you can get some real like footwork out of them and mm -hmm. not be like thinking about scuffing them or some shit like that. Yeah. Um, which goes back to my earlier point. I always get sneakers that I look at and go, those will look dope as they get worn in. Cause I know what I'm gonna do to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the sneakerhead that kept mine pristine. Yeah. I'm like, nah, nah, I'm gonna I'm get another pair go to of work. sneakers. Yeah, I'm so here like, to go to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, I got you, I got you. Um, What's ironic is I had a pair of green and black SB Dunks when I danced in Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, cause remember we had- Comfy. We had club music in Jersey from 2000s forward. Yeah. So the rest of the world's catching up and like, nah, that was always our stuff. So we had like DJ Wala, mm -hmm. um, Cool Kid and a couple other DJs that were just like DJ Tamil, mm -hmm. just like classics. Yeah. And it's like you'd go to like Route 22, that was like a skating rink, and we would like be battling over there. You had uh, EPE Entertainment, uh, which stands for Eating Pussy Entertainment. And that was like a street team in Jersey, and like they were throwing parties. Yeah, Jersey is a very nasty city. Yeah, it's at state, so it's Got like you. you know, especially over in Newark, Brick City. Mm -hmm. The names didn't matter. It was like, hey, who pulling up? Yeah. That was like uh, back when the Wu Tang dance first hit the scene from Philly, gotcha. coming up to Jersey. Yeah, and I was a part of like a lot of different. I wouldn't say teams and squad because I had my own squad. We were Colors Crew. And we'd be battling folks like uh, Illmatic Force. They they kicked our ass over at my uh, college. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that high school performance over at Maris? But it was great getting to know them. Yeah. Um, Envy, that was another well-known dance group out of Jersey that I used to practice with back in the day. So when I hear about these dance things, I'm like, damn, you was putting in work. And also, oh, your yeah, shoes right. that you were putting work in, they weren't your everyday shoe to wear, though. Because, nah, nah, like, nah. They, 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 made, they made your foot uncomfortable after a while. Like, oh, oh, like, yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> um, so there was definitely that, like, wearing in aspect uh -huh. of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, the other thing is I was an all-styles kid. So it's like, I did... Crump, I hung out with the breakers and learned that. I learned mm -hmm. popping, I learned locking. Like, yeah. I, like when you talk about Boston dance history, mm -hmm. I used to teach at Funk Phenomenon. I used to rock with Floor Lords. I got taught by Megatron and Shallows, mm -hmm. like two old heads as far as popping uh, mm -hmm. in that area. Um, that go all the way back to like the 70s. Mm -hmm. My dad went to high school with one of them. Like, it was, it was very much like I came up in the kingdom type shit. Mm -hmm. uh, the SB thing really came from streetwear culture and that progressing into dance by way of crump because mm -hmm. with breaking and popping, yeah. the, the shoes were uh, Sacconis mm -hmm. and uh, Adidas. Yeah. And I did not like either of those things. I was like, no. <laughs> that was back when Shell Toes was popular fucking, and I never understood I never why the Shell Toes were popular. I got popular. one pair of Shell Toes yeah, I was, and like, I was like, nah. like, started hanging out with a crew uh, mm -hmm. of people or whatever. And like, you know, you're like first getting your like gear, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, like this is cool. Let me get this, and then you're like, nah, no. don't fuck with nah. this. Um, yeah. And it was the same thing with Air Force Ones. I was like, these are just clunky and heavy. Yeah. I don't fuck with those these. Air Force Ones back in the day. I think were not as well made as they are now. Like, and I don't know yeah. whether it's the design. I, the material was better back then but yeah. the design is better now in terms of how it fits yeah. how it's executed and how it's tied together yeah. yeah the construction and the engineering like they've definitely made them a lot better but like mm -hmm. i was i come from half a size too big mm -hmm. extra sock folded over at the toe yeah to keep the toe creases for coming like you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. there's just so many things that now i'm like that shit was fucking ridiculous <laughs> but like that's an era bro like that's yeah. that's a real era and like uh, or watching like paid in full mm -hmm. and seeing like the older brother put the kicks on and you're just like yeah, yeah. that was but, I, but I, that I era to. that era was about reservation 100% and that's that's what it really it was came down to actual scarcity yeah there was an actual like yo yeah. we're gonna make this one time yeah and there's gonna be this many yeah now it's like I got a direct I was, so that, I was waiting for the time to bring this up mm -hmm. so these are not real sneakers mm -hmm. um, well are they custom no, so, kind of. Mm -hmm. So, the way that, first of all, capitalism works because people don't know how 
uh, manufacturing works. Yeah. So it's the only reason why people pay above cost for things is because mm -hmm. America has created a social expectation that somehow participating mm -hmm. in the upcharge they created makes you the demand yeah yeah and, like, and, and created like a moral attachment to wanting to pay the upcharge like mm -hmm. yeah I do my thing and it's like yeah no yeah. That's bullshit um, the same factories that originally made the sneaker that was designed and given to Nike in order to run mm -hmm. made X amount of sneakers mm -hmm. Nike stamps Let's say five hundred out of a thousand. It's yeah. like these are the ones that we're gonna sell. Mm -hmm. Those other five hundred got to get gotta sold go somewhere. Yeah. Now, now mm -hmm. those five hundred, five hundred get sold. This originally came out. I don't know, like twenty sixteen or some mm -hmm. bullshit like that. Same factory. The same factory has the print. What you think they get rid of the archives? No. So they have no the the prints. Yeah. They have the the materials. Mm -hmm. They have the design, mm -hmm. and they have the time to make the construction better and better and better. So yeah. to your point, although these are remanufactured, mm -hmm. these are probably manufactured better than the people who got the original pair. Yeah, because we're dealing with twenty twenty four, and we've now been doing this silhouette, so we know how to make sure that everything holds together, sticks together the right way, so on and so forth. Also, no matter how large the corporation is that's called Nike, they don't actually own the stuff in that factory At across all. the wall. No, yeah. Because it's not it's not cost effective. Yeah. The it's business was that five hundred. That out. was the that was the business. And yeah. that's why you're paying mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're paying to get the shoes instead of the person. So honestly, I'm a huge advocate for like if you like the sneaker, mm -hmm. find an Instagram page that has a dude from China and he's gonna fucking uh uh PayPal the money over to him. He sends it over to you. Ten, seven to ten days, mm -hmm. and there we go. The funniest, so here, here are the funniest parts about it. And this is why I don't shrink away from it. Mm -hmm. I had there's not a single streetwear store that I go into where they don't look at my feet when I'm wearing these mm -hmm. and treat me like I am covered in gold from top to bottom. Yeah, it's really just a funny experiment because yeah. it's like whether I'm buying something or not. For some reason, you feel obligated to mm -hmm. give me a higher level of service because you perceive yeah. that I have something that you don't have access to. I'll give you the Instagram where I got these, my G. Mm -hmm. I'll ship them to you seven to ten days. Yeah. It's like 178 <laughs> bucks. It really ain't that serious. That's money well spent. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm like I'm trying to pay right now. Retail mm -hmm. is like 200 some. A hundred and sixty, hundred seventy dollars. Yeah. Indistinguishable. Yeah. In and every way. When I tell you the box that these came in had the tissue paper mm -hmm. that came in the original thing. Yeah. And the internal, like you know, some Jordan boxes. Yeah. The inside of the box have like. And that's the how they measure. Hey, the inside joint, of the box, the tissue, the wear. Yeah. yeah. They got the little magnetic strip. The dude I buy from mm -hmm. has, uh, uh, what do you call it? Customer review after customer review of people getting their stuff sold off to StockX like it's nothing. Yeah. Approved. So it's like for anybody who's going to crack jokes at this, mm -hmm. the six pairs of shoes that you bought off of StockX that are in your closet right now, you're about $800 over retail for something that was not originally manufactured for the mm -hmm. Nike sale that you were told. I think I'm okay with paying my 178 So what does it mean to walk a day in your shoes? What does it mean to walk a day in my shoes? When I say it, or like someone... No, 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 mind. for you. For you, walking a day in your shoes. Pressure. That's the first word that comes to mind, pressure. Um, pressure in the weight of awareness. I think that there's... Ignorance is bliss. Is what it comes down to and i wouldn't want to over exaggerate the amount of like knowledge that i have and i don't think i need to to make that point but just the more that you know the harder it is to find joy and so to walk a day in my shoes is to probably experience a profound amount of pressure that you may not have allowed yourself to feel because you're okay with being ignorant and that's not shade, that's not judgment. I implore you to stay over there. Stay the fuck over there. Don't come over here. It's not ignorance, fun over here. Ignorance truly is bliss. Yeah. Yeah. So, without being like, uh, I don't know, without being like dramatic about it. You're like not trying to be like, a Debbie Downer, you're being yeah, it's like Yeah, yeah it's like, honest. I'm just actually being real. Like just yeah. the level of pressure involved in awareness is so high that it's like, yo, you're actually better off not seeking enlightenment. I, I am in a, 
a alignment coach. I'm not an enlightenment coach. Yeah. You don't want none of these problems. Yeah. Just align your shit and you'll feel great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause that's that's actually what you're searching for. And that's why like I think it's important for you and I to continue having like the check ins, the conversations on camera mm -hmm. for people to understand like I'm I'm chasing him to get all these answers, but like what we've done in that class, that is the answer itself. Nice. Like that thought process, yep. applying it to my life. If it doesn't work for my life, that's cool. I could come back and say, hey, these things didn't work. And then we don't have the discussion. I don't know if you saw my post, but I was very serious when I was like, hey, there are people who encourage me to come back to the event space and this is who I'd like to do it with and also created the anticipation of I will be doing this with him until the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Look forward to seeing you guys. Yeah. And after I put that post up, I sent a personal text message to seven people and I said, see you on Wednesday. Yeah, that's it. Just see you on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, half yeah. of them was like, yeah, the other half was like, hey, whatever the next date is, let me know. Right. I said, bet. And that's what real community looks like when it comes to the work that we do. Are people able to either be excited for what you do or simply look forward to the fact that they got an invitation and that they still haven't found what it is we're providing when you're not active. Yeah. Cause I'm, I think uh, it's very important to get happy when people have found something similar to what you're doing. Cause then for me, I'm like, all right, well, that means I get to work on this other thing cause right. someone got it. Right, right. <laughs> no, 100%. And like, I've honestly been looking at a lot of my content through that lens where it's like, mm -hmm. yo, I can do less. Yeah. Cause I can just focus on this one thing over here. Mm -hmm. Cause someone else got it <laughs> yeah and if they got it hey guys that's who you go to yeah yeah and then this is the next step after that but please mm -hmm. still continue to go to that if you can afford to for sure and if you can't i'm very i'm a big proponent of okay well which one is most important for what you have going on right now that's mm -hmm. only an answer you can answer i just just what we're providing is what we're providing and i purposely let folks know hey i plan on having a discussion with you guys now you're just coming to class and we talk and that's oh yeah it. no that's not that's not yeah. what's happening you're yeah. definitely on the hook for conversation yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i share my stories just just how does that make you feel can you guys relate to that mm -hmm. what what do you feel is next do you want to text me in the middle of the week and we just have like a quick five to ten minute check-in and a pop-up because like sometimes i don't think being heard is always the point sometimes it's acknowledgement of the story is what people are looking for yeah and putting them in position for that i think is important to the work that we do yo this is new you can find me at nil.art and this is a day in my shoes